Welcome back to part two of the wild world of histamine. I'm going to lead with something kind of controversial. You all might have been lied to on the internet, and we're going to correct the record. Amy, do you think that's bold enough that people will be intrigued by this episode? Probably. No one likes being lied to, so. No. And I will say that's admittedly clickbaity right off the get go. (laughs) I think that all of these people who put forth information probably have the best of intentions, but a lot of people don't check their freaking sources. And what ends up happening is a big game of telephone and a big game of just like recycled garbage. You know, oh, I found one blog Mm -hmm. that says this food is high in histamine. So I'm going to put it on my blog too. So if I may outline the episode for our dear viewers, we're going to start the episode by talking about what a low histamine diet looks like, aka reducing histamine from your food. And again, this is more, less concrete than you have been led to believe, right? right. We're going to we're gonna share what seems to be the truth of the matter here in 2024. Then part two, we're going to talk about the microbiota connection and one microbe in particular that is theorized to be a big histamine producer. So that might be really interesting for some folks at home who have gotten stool testing done. Granted, like three episodes ago, we talked about how stool testing is not that fantastic. But you know, for funsies, we're going to have this this deep dive episode. So Amy, without further ado, I have brought something here for you, a gift, as it were. Are you ready for the gift? Oh, God. Okay. I'm, I, I'm ready, I think. <laughs> You're bracing yourself. Yes. So do you remember pretty recently we did an episode on the perfect candida diet? And hmm. I did a Google image search of a bunch of different infographics of what that diet looks like according to the general Google wisdom. I did the same thing. So uh-huh. let's go on a journey. Let's go on a journey just from the first couple of hits on a Google image search when we search for a low histamine diet. And then we will talk about what the reality actually is from our clinical experience and from the research that we do have available. Okay. Mm. All right. So here is one particular blog and they, they have a nice chart. So they say high histamine foods that you have to avoid processed, smoked, cured, canned and preserved meats, sausages, bacon, and ham. Actually, I feel like that's by and large true. Right. When you say reasonable, similarly cured, smoked, canned, uh, and frozen seafood. That's interesting that they throw frozen seafood in because that's actually much lower in histamine. They also say that oily fish like sardines, salmon, tuna, and canned fish are a problem. Shellfish, mahi mahi, anchovies, and herring. But then they say fresh caught fish is okay. I, I'm actually going to poke a hole in that one right away. I What I have heard through the histamine kind of world is that frozen fish, like if you buy it in the freezer section of your grocery store, that's generally flash frozen on the boat out in the ocean still. So mm-hmm. fr- frozen fish should be fine, but quote unquote fresh fish that you see like out on display in the seafood section of the grocery store, that has been sitting out at refrigerator temperature for at least a couple of days, typically. Mm. So I disagree with this. I think that frozen seafood is lower in histamine, quote unquote, fresh seafood is probably higher. And I don't know why they're throwing oily fish under the bus specifically. I don't right. I don't think that like the oiliness of the fish has anything to do with it. I think it's right. just how how long has that animal been deceased is the reality right. of it. Well, I think too, like just a caveat before we get too in the weeds as well. I think we might have mentioned this in the last episode, but just to rehash, I do think that that this is a spectrum thing. Mm. So, you know, some people could potentially tolerate more histamine dietarily than others. And that's something to keep in mind, too. Like there's rules of thumb and some people might need to go a little bit further in their reduction of histamine than other people. And so it might take you a little bit of time to figure out how much histamine you can put in your specific bucket compared to someone else. Yeah. And that's a really good lead in. Also, I'll throw out there, not only is there going to be a a different amount of histamine that each person could tolerate, but your bucket can change as time goes on. 
Right. So actually, one of my good friends who she started out as a patient, funny enough, and then we just kept in touch yeah. after we were done working together. Um, she sometimes listened to the podcast. Hi, Kara, if you're listening. But she has shared with me before that now, like, she's kind of far enough into this histamine stuff with her health that she's figured out that when she manages her stuff well, right, like, she's doing her self-care, mm. her work is not crazy, her life is not crazy, her medically complex child's health kind of stuff is not crazy. When her stress is well managed, she can eat histamine. Like right. she's told, I, you know, she can eat strawberries, she can eat whatever, and she doesn't have to worry about it. But if she slacks off on the self care or one of those big stressors comes into play, mm. she notices that her, her histamine tolerance goes way down and she has right. to be much more conscious of whether or not she's filling that bucket. So, you know, it, it could even be a matter of maybe your bucket is a certain size today, but then two weeks from now, it's, you know, the bucket is bigger and you can tolerate right. more. And then maybe three months from now, something awful happens and maybe your bucket shrinks down to the size of a thimble and you can hardly tolerate any histamine. So that's another wild card too. And this is part of what makes this whole conversation so, so difficult is that this is changing all the time. It's not a yeah. static thing. Well, it's a good reminder to not look at it through the lens of being really black and white. Um, I, I think that that's a good thing most of the time in how you're assessing a lot of things regarding health and a lot of dietary, um, you know, trying to figure out wh what diet works best for you. It's it's good not to have like black and white thinking, like I have to do it this way, or this is the only way, or this is the perfect yeah. diet, histamine diet. I think it's, like you said, it's going to ebb and flow a little bit. I think the degree of which you need to abide by hi low histamine is also going to vary from individual to individual. Um, even on the spectrum of like maybe having histamine intolerance, there's going to be a, a big, there could be a big spectrum of what that means. So yeah, I, I agree. I think it's just a good lead in to have that in mind when you're approaching uh, what foods to potentially take in on what to take out. Yeah. Well, and a couple of things too, is that in our last episode, we talked about antihistamine nutrients and antihistamine foods to add into your mm. diet for the sake of neutralizing or excreting histamine. So another point too, to make here is that you want to lead with that. Mm -hmm. You want to lead with making sure that you have the nutrients and the foods to clear histamine out of your body you don't want to lead with this, but this is what people do. People Google low histamine right. diet. They get an infographic like what I pulled up here on my screen, and then they think they need to eliminate all of these foods super strictly. And what I've seen a lot of people do too is that they will pull up like six different versions of the low histamine diet, and there will be foods that make the appearance on one list but not the others. And they'll think, ooh, I better make super double, triple sure that I'm being strict enough. So I'm going to eliminate everything, even if it shows up on just one list. So it takes something that's already quite restrictive and it restricts it down even right. worse. And this is where a lot of people end up eating like 10 or 12 foods because they're either doing one diet so, so strictly or heaven forbid, they're trying to include like a low histamine diet and low FODMAP or low right. histamine and paleo or low histamine and vegan. And they're combining multiple restrictive diets and it's just a freaking nightmare nutritionally. Yeah. Yeah. The stack, anytime you're stacking different diets, even if they're sort of different variations of the same diet, that gets a little problematic for sure and could yeah. lead to uh, restricting more than you need to and nutrient deficiencies and kind of everything that comes along with that disordered eating right poor relationship with food poor vagal tone because now you're not enjoying your food and connecting with your food in the same way right yeah it's it's a slippery slope um but yeah so okay so i'm gonna go back over here um i also i feel like with the candida episode i pulled up these infographics and we just went through them kind of rapid fire together and this one, I'm finding that I'm taking a moment to pause about individual foods and comment on them. Uh, do you think that's okay? We're going to have like a yeah. producer moment in the middle of the episode. Yeah, right you're, okay. fine. Um, you're fine. You're fine. Because what I don't want to have happen is like, 
I don't want to rattle off all these foods from an infographic and then forget to comment on one that's blatantly incorrect. Right. And have people have incorrect information. So, all right. So continuing from this one infographic, people, we're still on the first one and I pulled up three. We could go through them pretty quickly though. Um, Okay. Vegetables to avoid because they're high in histamine. This person lists eggplant, tomato and tomato products, mushrooms, spinach, and pickled vegetables, as well as tempeh and like potato chips, like, uh, you know, tortilla chips, potato chips, that sort Mm. of stuff. Um, I feel like that's overall what I kind of see on most of the histamine lists. Certainly the nightshades, like the tomatoes, the peppers, the eggplant, that sort of thing makes a list. Um, if I remember correctly, I think mushrooms are a little bit hit and miss. And I, I've i seen quite a lot of people who do just fine on spinach, actually. So I'm pretty well convinced that spinach is not that big of a histamine contributor for most people. Hmm. Uh, and I don't really know the nature of why they included tempeh. I, I know it's fermented, I guess. Like maybe that's the rationale behind hmm. that. Um, but can you think of any other vegetables that would get kind of demonized for the histamine side of things? Um. You know, tomatoes come to mind. I can't remember if did did they did they come up when you were listing? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So like tomatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, right? The one that they did kind of like the nightshadey type. Y- ones. Yeah, um, I I would say all of the nightshades except for potatoes. Usually potatoes right. seem like they're fine. Right. Yeah. The and again, I I think that like again that that's why maybe experimentation is helpful with some of these things. Cause I would say typically tomatoes are like usually a bigger trigger than maybe something like an eggplant or even like a bell pepper potentially. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, that's uh, the, the, the tomatoes seem to be a bigger trigger for more people with histamine. Um, yeah. Tomatoes are pretty consistent and we'll, we'll weigh in on that in a second. Like the big foods, mm. um, that are pretty consistent. Tomatoes definitely make the top of the list as far as like everybody who seems to have a histamine issue really <laughs> doesn't get along with tomatoes when they're, when their bucket is small. Um, right. Okay. Now fruit, they have a couple that make sense and a couple that surprised me. So on this infographic, they say uh, there's a couple of tropical fruits. So like papaya, banana, pineapple, avocado, those all pretty much make the list by and large. Uh, strawberries and citrus fruit tend to make the list as well. The one that surprises me on here is cherries. Have mm. you ever once seen cherries make a, a high histamine food list? I don't think so. I don't think I have either. That one's really surprising to me. And again, I'm picturing a world where somebody's trying to figure this out and they Google and they come across infographics like this and they see cherries show up on one list and they're like, oops. That's that's no go, but then there's a good source of fiber and like enjoyment that right. they can have in their life. Like they're missing out on some nutrition because it showed up on one list potentially. But right. I don't think I've ever seen that show up on a list, and I've never met a histamine person yet who can't do cherries. Aside right. from if they happen to have a FODMAP issue and they're working with me because of IBS, SIBO, e kind of stuff, then sure. But right. it's more of a FODMAP thing rather than a histamine thing yeah i would agree yeah and then last but not least on this particular infographic (laughs) they throw all flour under the bus they literally say all flours and yeasted bread refined and processed grains wheat germs and pastry but then they say that cooked grains like rice quinoa buckwheat and millet are okay Again, I don't know if like wheat and flour based Mm. things really are high histamine. I think this is part of the complication with these lists too, is that histamine intolerant people can react to a food, not because it contains histamine Mm. and not because it's a mass cell degranulator that releases histamine, but because they have like a food sensitivity or a food allergy toward that food. Right. And so, you know, like this particular list also says... All cheese is off off the menu for histamine purposes. And I don't think that's true either. Um, like aged, older cheeses certainly can be triggery for people, but fresh cheeses are usually fine. 
But I think that lists like this oftentimes confuse the idea of something that's a common food sensitivity or a common food allergy, and that mm. elicits symptoms versus something that really, truly contains histamine or triggers the release of histamine. Mm. Yeah. So. Oh, and I just caught out of the corner of my eye, by the way, under the fruit category, they threw plums under the bus. Hmm. That's another one that's really random to me. I've never seen plums right. make any other list, but this is one of the top Google hits did that you get say, when you do a did Google they put dry, Did they put dried fruit in there? They did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I grazed over that one too. Sorry. Yeah. Because that's another one. I think anytime there's like an aged, dried, fermented, uh, cured, like some of those type foods or that fall into those brackets could certainly be like the bigger when you're talking about tomatoes or some things that are like the bigger kind of all encompassing yeah. um, histamine intolerant foods. Those tend to be the biggest buckets, I would say mm -hmm. that people uh, that most people with histamine might need to avoid the degree yeah. of which you like go pretty granular from there could depend on the severity. Yeah. And I'll throw this out there too. Dried fruit can really spike your blood sugar and having big wild blood sugar swings is probably not going to make your mast cells very happy. So I wonder also, is it, you know, the sulfites in dried fruit? Is it something about dried fruit itself or is it the massive amount of sugar that's like uh, crusted on the outside of them? You know what? I, I think that it could be a little bit of is that because it's dried, the volume gets distorted a little bit. So I almost wonder sometimes if people like eat a higher amount of the food too. So, you know, a date is pretty calorie dense, like in terms of how little it is and how much sugar is in it. Um, compared to if you ate, uh, you know, a date that wasn't, you know, uh, dried um or again yeah. like if you ate a uh um like i like dried apricots or something like if you ate an apricot you might get full faster just because there's water and um you know it's it's more it's more volume than yeah. like a dried apricot so uh that's a really I, good point i think that that happens where people are like oh i'm having five ap dried apricots yeah. And that kind of distorts uh, the it distorts the volume aspect, which I think can make a bigger difference too. And there could be something about the actual change in in structure too. Um, but I also wonder again if people are just kind of consuming higher amounts because they're smaller. Yeah, that that is a really good point because you're right. Normally, like for me at least, I would eat two apricots in a sitting right. and that would be perfectly fine but if they're dried i could absolutely see myself pounding down five or ten right. dried apricots i mean i don't because i just know for me personally that uh dried fruit spikes my blood sugar like crazy right so i try to not do dried fruit unless it's like dates or date paste if i'm doing something that calls for it in a recipe but um yeah that's a really solid point mm-hmm Good, good detective working. I hey. like it. I well, like I always it. like think about too, like the, the like 100 calorie raisin packs. You know, my dad really likes those. Uh, but it's like, oh, 100 calories of actual grapes would be a fairly big volume of grapes. Not mm. that like I think that'd be abnormal, but like a little, like that little tiny raisin pack is like yeah, this so big. Easy. You know, so it's like you just almost just kind of throw it in, and then you're like, whoop. <laughs> And it's really not, usually the raisins packs are like kind of portioned out. So it probably wouldn't lead to as much over consumption. Hmm. Um, but it is just, in, it, it shows the volume difference when you see like, oh, this little tiny box of cute little box of raisins would be like this probably fairly decent sized bowl of grapes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that you're spot on there. And again, I do wonder about the, the, processing of the dried fruit because mm -hmm. oftentimes they do use i forget if it's sulfites or or right. what but there's usually something in it to preserve it and specifically to make the color bright and beautiful uh, if you get the hippy dippy dried mango or dried apricots from like whole foods or something or you order it online 
they're not that appetizing looking to be perfectly honest they they're kind of like this pale color with like a grayish brown kind of hue to it like they look they look preserved versus if you buy regular person dried fruit at the regular person store right mm. it's going to have you know like the the dried apricots are these bright orange beautiful apricot color and it's because of those preservatives and the sulfites and the chemicals that they use in the drying process. So, yeah, I wonder how much of it is the sugar thing. I wonder how much of it is just like you wouldn't eat this volume of them if it was a normal fruit right. sort of a scenario. And I wonder how much of it is the chemicals that they use when they dry the the food versus something about the drying process in and of itself. Mm -hmm. But you're right. It, those tend to make it on the majority of the list is dried fruit. That's another big contender. Um, some other ones uh, that I've seen, I'll just, I'll make mention of one more infographic and then we'll get into just a normal conversation here. Um, but some other ones that surprised me from a different infographic, and to be clear, I don't necessarily agree with these. That's why I'm saying they surprise me. Um, this infographic says canned beans, cinnamon, coffee, collagen, garbanzo beans, legumes just in general, prepackaged rice and pasta meals, tea, and I think there was one more on here that, that kind of surprised me a bit. No, I guess that's it. But again, like a, a handful of odd, oddball ones that make it into these infographics and handouts that we see on the internet, and then that's where our people are getting their information from. So it could be concerning, to say the least. Well, and, and I think it also sometimes becomes an issue if you're outright searching, Do, is, you know, a turnip uh, have histamine? And then you see like, oh, you found one infographic that had that turnip or something in it, even though the majority don't. So I think sometimes, again, it can be tricky, too, if you're like seeking out one specific food. And then you'll sometimes find some, you know, blog or something saying that that one's elevated in histamine, even though the majority don't say that. Yeah. And and again, a lot of these folks who are dealing with this and thinking and Googling about, about this, they're so sick and they're so sick and tired of being sick and tired, right? And they're right. just, they're desperate. <laughs> they want to feel better and part of me kind of appreciates the mentality of I'm going to be like the world's most compliant patient. I'm going to do this diet as, as like strictly as humanly possible because I want to feel better. Like part of me understands that and really almost admires that gumption to dial it in and do it really, really well. But again, what happens is there's a million different opinions on the internet and the vast, vast, vast majority of people are not fact checking mm -hmm. and they're not looking at the sources and they're not really reading research. They're just recycling and reverberating the same old garbage every day. And so you get, you get these weird like internet echo chambers that are just full of untruths. And again, it makes people restrict their diet way more than they actually have to. Right. Yeah. 100%. Um, and I think there are a lot of well-intentioned but ill-informed practitioners who even lead people on that journey, right? right? Like I've seen low histamine lists coming from other functional medicine people and nutrition people, and they they do the same damn thing. They Google it, they go to the websites, and they slap together a list. And it's just, it's very frustrating. Um, the inconsistent and sometimes untruthful information that gets perpetuated. So right. we like to be a safe place for you to get your information from because Amy and I really do try to stay informed and like look at these sorts of things and try to read research and really investigate this stuff. We're not going to take something at face value typically. So mm -hmm. plug for the old IBS Freedom podcast here. But look at you. That look at you plugging us. I know, I know. I mean, they're, they've are they been listening to this episode for 24 minutes, so hopefully they like our podcast, right? <sighs> Otherwise, why True. are you here? Um, True. But I'll say another good resource that I know both you and I have, have followed for a number of years is Chris Masterjohn. And we've mentioned him in some recent episodes for various reasons, but 
He has a video, uh, if you want to look on Facebook or YouTube, it's his Chris Master John Light series, and it's Chris Master John Light number 88, Dietary Histamine, How Reliable Is the Information? And he goes through one particular review article where they're looking at data from like laboratory analysis and human studies and review articles, and they're really like going through the table saying, hey, is this high, low, or medium in histamine? And what he points out in this video to kind of give away the whole point is that even the research is pretty inconsistent. Like one food Mm -hmm. could be labeled as low histamine in one study, high histamine in another study, and then medium histamine in a third study. And it's just, it's, it's still kind of a big unknown. So That being said, and you can watch the video for more information, but what would you say, Amy, if somebody came to you and said, I want to do a low histamine diet, I'm going to, I'm going to work on sleep, stress, movement, nutrition on sexy basics, because that's always number one. I'm going to try to add some of the low hist or the antihistamine foods that you talked about last episode. But now I'm starting to think that I might need to restrict a little bit and I want to do it conservatively and smartly what foods should I probably cut out for the time being to really give this a fair shot of helping me? Like, what would you say are the big, you know, prize winners? Mm -hmm. They show up on every list and every person seems to have a genuine issue with them when they are histamine sensitive. Yeah. Again, I I think going back to like the aged, the fermented, the dried, like those types of foods are going to be usually problematic for the vast majority of people tomatoes um i I would say probably being more cautious of alcohol in general would be a a good one as well um usually things like citrus can be a little bit more problematic um you know i I think that there's there's a little bit more variability there but usually that's going to be um more of an issue. But yeah, I think again, if you're steering clear of like aged, fermented, cured, um, you know, I I agree with smoked, processed, canned, like fish, like you were saying at the beginning, I think could be definitely problematic. Um, Those types of foods, I think are going to be the biggest heavy hitters. Um, and, And again, if you can, if you start there, and kind of see how you how you do that's probably best just because i you can get away with restricting a little bit without it affecting nutrition too much um because that's the other takeaway too we talked about last episode how you know you do have to make sure you're getting enough nutrition and the more you cut out and the more you potentially stack different histamine style diets on top of each other the harder it's going to be to get all the nutrition that you need to help metabolize histamine properly. So it's such a, it's such an important trade-off to recognize that like you probably still want to have the goal of eating as broad as possible instead of having the goal of eliminating every histamine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cause it's just, that's going to be almost impossible to do is to eliminate histamine completely from your diet. So it's just about how much do you need to kind of lower the bucket to make progress? Um, Because I think if you're doing all the basic stuff, your bucket should grow. Um, But I think in terms of like symptom management and helping kind of lowering inflammation, if there is like a histamine, a big histamine component, just getting the big heavy hitters out of the way is probably your best bet. And then um, kind of seeing how everything evolves from there. If you have to go a little bit um, deeper than that, like pull back, you know, bananas or avocado or like a little bit um, more than that, that's okay. I think, I also think too, if, if it feels like you're someone with really a lot of more severe issues, um, I don't know if we've really talked about it much in the first episode, but sometimes being treated for like MCAS or, um, you know, more intensive histamine issues, uh, with like, uh, sodium chromalin or like some other antihistamines that are more prescription could also be beneficial. 
um, for a period of time. If you feel like, again, like, oh, my diet's getting like really restrictive and I feel like I have to be on this restrictive diet, that could kind of continue to dig you into, dig you into a hole. Um, I think for some people it might make sense to try to manage it. Um, and I would say this is a sm- really small group of people, but I have seen some people that really benefit from doing more pharmaceutical interventions, at least for a period of time, and just not focusing solely on the diet being the main thing to reduce symptoms. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think it it reminds me a little bit of the conversation I mentioned with my friend where there are other factor factors mm. that help her either grow or shrink her bucket or like open the drainage out of the bucket. Right. And medication can be a part of that for some people. If you're finding that you do have to restrict to an unsustainable level and it's it's impacting your ability to get adequate levels of vitamins and minerals and fiber and protein and calories, you might really want to consider that. And I've, I've seen this before, even recently with a FODMAP Freedom student. We typically, histamine is later in the conversation with FODMAP Freedom. It's like week nine. But every now and then when we're reviewing people's intake stuff and, and like talking to people, sometimes we get a whiff of histamine right in the beginning of the program. And we had one of those recently with this last group where he hadn't mentioned it. He hadn't explored it. I don't think it was on his radar, but a lot of his symptomology was striking us as histaminic in nature. Mm. So we we provided a little bit of coaching about the histamine thing right out the gate, which we wouldn't typically do. And for him, one of the things that I suggested was, hey, go to your primary care and just see if they're willing to do a trial run with Cromulin. Because right. I have seen that happen where it, it seems like it's a safe enough medication that most doctors are willing to at least take a stab at it and prescribe it for a month or two and let you try it as as sort of like almost as a diagnostic aid, right? Mm-hmm. If you have a good response to Cromulin, then there's some likelihood that there is a histamine or a mast cell component to what's going on with you. Versus if you try Cromulin and you don't have any notable impact from it, then it's probably less likely that that's a huge driving factor for you. But um, that that's always an option. You could just ask your even your primary care provider, hey, would you be willing to let me try this for a month or two and just see how I do with it? Right. Right. And that's, I think that's a better way to go. And it's more attainable than trying to test for mast cell activation because that testing is notoriously difficult to do Mm. because the activity of mast cells and what they're secreting goes up and down Mm. like minute by minute. It's, it's very inconsistent. So you could have, for example, elevated blood histamine at 8am and then by 9am it's in the normal range. Mm. (laughs) Good, good luck testing for this, you know? So I think it actually makes more sense to try something like Cromulin and just take a stab at it and see how you do. Um, yeah. Well, and, and one last point kind of in, in in weighing like pros and cons of of what to do to, you know, there's usually this like curve with something like a histamine intolerance where like eliminating some foods is beneficial. It like helps you um, manage symptoms so that you can like do other things and get through your day, that sort of thing while you work on other things. Then, like, if you go too far with the restriction, it causes stress and food fears, things like that. But the added stress and food fears also are going to cause more histamine. So there's that to consider, too. So if, again, you're getting to this point where it's like, ooh, I, the, if I'm going to take out more foods, it's going to be counterproductive. That also might be, a again, an indicator if you're super stressed to maybe try something different, like, again, cromelin or you know, just kind of holding with where you're currently at from a restrictive standpoint. Um, Because at some point, I do think it becomes counter uh, counterproductive to healing if you're just stressed from the actual inner the restrictions that you're doing. Well, and like we said, too, so not only will stress chemistry degranulate mast cells and add give you the gift of more histamine, right? But also, um, you're going to have a hard time getting adequate levels of your nutrition, your vitamins and minerals, 
And that's going to make it harder to excrete histamine once it is in your body. And it's going to make it harder for you to make those enzymes and run those enzymes like Dow to actually get rid of the stuff once it's there. Mm. So yeah, I think I think the graph probably, if they start at a baseline of zero, right, like their starting point, cutting out a handful of foods, like we said, the heavy hitters, right? Tomatoes, basically all the nightshades except for tomato or except for potatoes, I think is worth investigating for most people, but especially tomatoes. Aged, fermented, smoked, canned, preserved, heavily processed meats and seafood kind of items. Um, Dried fruit, we mentioned, is a big one. Citrus fruit is pretty consistent for most people, especially at larger quantities. And then maybe you could throw in, um, I mean, honestly, that's where I would start most people. I would also say balsamic vinegar. Yeah. Um, Not so much apple cider vinegar, but balsamic aged vinegar, certainly. I would just start with that for most people. But to your point, you get some positive benefit when you restrict a little bit in this scenario for somebody who truly is histamine intolerant. But then it's like the graph takes a nosedive and you actually go below zero and you get into the negative numbers because now any additional benefit you're getting is going to be smaller and smaller and smaller. But now the cost of getting that benefit is getting greater and greater and greater. Mm. And it's actually digging you into a deeper hole than you realize. Right. So again, it's it's what we've talked about in other episodes. It's the metaphor of somebody who's in a deep hole and they want to get out of the hole, but they don't realize that the thing that they're doing to try to get out of the hole is actually digging them deeper. So as they're shoveling their way deeper, they're saying, God damn it, why can't I get out of this hole? And it, right. it's like, ooh, you don't realize that you're digging yourself deeper with further dietary restriction. Mm-hmm. It's tough. Totally. And something like cromulin or quercetin, if you want to go more the natural route, that could be a bit of, you know, a ladder or a rope that you throw down into the hole to at least pull you partway out of it so that you can kind of get your bearings and start building yourself back up again. Yeah. Sometimes, again, like similar to how, um, you know, a doctor might use cromulin as a as a diagnostic tool for histamine issues. Sometimes, again, quercetin is sort of interesting because it's like... Uh, you have someone that sort of like looks a little histamine like um, and just it can almost be be similar. It can indicate if what you're experiencing actually is histamine. Like if someone's kind of on the fence of like whether they're kind of falling into that camp. Um, sometimes I I suggest histamine or sorry, quercetin or nettles or something like that just to see if it helps symptoms at all. Um, yeah. It, yeah. You. You could view it as treating empirically, or again, you could view it as a diagnostic trial. Right. If if your symptoms improve a lot when you try quercetin or another antihistamine kind of compound, there's a higher likelihood that that was a correct diagnosis or assumption for you. Um, So yeah, I, I think that that could be valuable for some folks, especially again, if they find that they are needing to restrict way more than is appropriate or mm-hmm. healthy for them. Right. Um, yeah. So I think that that more or less concludes my thoughts on that initial topic, which is the dietary restriction side. Mm-hmm. But again, I want to reemphasize, definitely go back and check out our other episode where we talk about antihistamine nutrients and antihistamine foods that you should be adding to your diet in order to combat histamine, because mm-hmm. it it doesn't make a lot of sense to try to reduce the intake into the bucket if you're just plugging the bucket up and you're not draining it mm. at all. You know, like, of course, you keep adding water. Eventually, it's just right. going to overflow no matter how much of a trickle is coming from that right. hose. So definitely go back and check out the other episode. But I wanted to uh, spend the last little bit of today's episode on the microbiome component of this. And there's a couple of interesting takeaways here. So there was a study published in 2022 that I think made a pretty good splash. And I say that because I think Lucy Mailing talked about it. And you know, it's a big deal when Lucy covers this. But the title of the article is Histamine Production by the Gut Microbiota Induces Visceral Hyperalgesia Through Histamine 4 Receptor Signaling in Mice. And basically, the gist of this is, is that they looked at people with irritable bowel syndrome 
and they took stool samples and they measured their urinary histamine output. And they found that about one third of the IBS cohort had elevated levels of urinary histamine. Two thirds did not, to be clear. So it's not a 100% sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But a third of people with IBS in this group, I think it was a group of 10 people, a third of them had elevated urinary histamine. And then they looked at the microbiome of those people. And they found that there was one person, I want to emphasize this, this is hardly a huge data set. But there was one single person with the highest urinary histamine level, who had a particular species of Klebsiella, Klebsiella erogenes, and that Klebsiella species had a particular gene, and that that combination made way more histamine than any mm. other microbe that they found. They said it was a hundredfold right. higher than any other microbe. For the people who were lower on the histamine spectrum, it was usually Enterococcus species producing histamine, but it was like a drop in the bucket by comparison. This one poor unfortunate soul had an over a a dysbiosis or an overgrowth of Klebsiella erogenes, again, with a particular gene. So we don't even know if all Klebsiella erogenes produces histamine. That's still unknown at this point. But what they found was that when they transplanted the microbiota from the humans with IBS into the mice, the mouse model, they found that the higher histamine production from the microbiome elicited visceral hypersensitivity Mm. and pain, much like the human model of IBS. So it's fascinating. But what I want to emphasize first, and then I'll let you comment on it is, you know, it I'm in the forums, right? I don't go in there much, but every now and then I will poke my head into like the gut club group or Mm. the SIBO SOS groups on Facebook. And I just, I want to get a sense of what people are talking about. And I seem to remember, especially when this paper came out, but there's been a trickle and a whisper ever since people will see an article like this and they'll take it to the bank and they'll say, Oh, I just need to look for this particular species on my stool test, or Mm. they'll extrapolate and say, if I have any Klebsiella overgrowth whatsoever, then I have a histamine issue. You see that with the GI map. You see that with functional people all the time. Oh, Klebsiella makes histamine. We don't know that. We don't know if we can extrapolate that far. We don't even know if all of this particular species produces tremendous amounts of histamine. We just know that this one strain with this one gene did for this one human being. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but it does make you wonder if the flavors of dysbiosis we have discussed before, right? Like Mm -hmm. low diversity, high levels of proteobacteria, including but not limited to Klebsiella. It makes you wonder if that is the environment that is conducive for the production of histamine in the gut. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It, well, it's interesting because, you know, I think dysbiosis in general can lead to like more immune activation in the gut lining. So again, more inflammation, which could include histamine, not even necessarily the generation of histamine from a microbe, but just from like your gut. <laughs> so like if your gut feels threatened because it it sees some microbes it doesn't like it's going to start producing different things to try to like attack and protect itself histamine being one of those compounds so i think there's also an element of like oh if things are just not balanced within the gut it can lead to more activation of your immune response which could include histamine now again like maybe not to the degree where it's showing up in your urine to like this crazy klebsiella (laughs) Uh, species that this guy had um but you know I, I think that there's probably there's there's probably definitely a link between dysbiosis and maybe having a little bit more histamine gut wise um i think but it's not the only factor i think sometimes there's that idea too in the functional space where it's like if the gut bacteria just become balanced, your histamine's going to be perfect and like everything's going to go back into balance. And yes, like that's a part of it, but like we've been mentioning all along, like 
your stress chemistry, like how your um, how your nutrition looks, your sleep, Mm -hmm. your movement, like all these things are going to affect like the histamine in the gut um, and and your and the histamine in cells and things like that. So, you know, I I think sometimes the microbiome histamine connection gets very oversimplified, which I think you were leading to with the Klebsiella orogenase. Super interesting. And I think it, that it's hard to argue that it couldn't be a fa- that it's not a factor to some degree, but it's not the only factor. And I hope that they do further studies on this, right? right. Like we have this initial little snippet of research in a cohort of 10 people and right. one particular person who had this bacteria producing bucket loads of histamine. Like that's neat. We should get a bigger sample size and we should do, we should do more testing in this sort of world. It's just right now we're limited to this one small study. And again, I see a lot of people kind of overblow it, but do you want to know my favorite part of the entire study, Amy? I have a quote pulled. Do you want to hear it? Yes, I actually do. Okay. I think you'll love this too. And you'll, you'll see why. Okay. Drum roll. Histamine production peaked at a pH of (laughs) 7.0 and decreased sharply at pH 6.0, whereas bacterial growth was inhibited at pH below 5. This suggests that bacterial histamine production was regulated by the acidity of the colonic millilo, which ranges from pH of 5.5 to 7.5 and is modulated by bacterial fermentation. Freaking fiber again, right, Amy. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> if you eat your fiber and your FODMAPs painted behind me and you have diversity and freaking mm. fiber in your diet and maybe lactobacillus, yogurt, yeah. fermented foods, if you de- if you eat those foods, you decrease the pH of the intestinal ecosystem, and that inhibits bacterial growth and histamine production in this otherwise potentially boogeyman bacteria. Right. Maybe the presence of the bacteria doesn't freaking matter. Right. Right. It's just a it's a byproduct of the environment. The, the it not being acidic enough. I, and you need to and acidify your colons, people. Yes. And then it's all too happy to grow and have a party and make a home in your colon. But, you know, I know um, Jason Haverleck is the one who kind of brought this to my attention initially. And I agree with him. I think two of the absolute best things for acidifying the gut ecosystem and therefore decreasing the growth of pathogens, such as Klebsiella, inulin, which is a big old FODMAPy FODMAP. Right, right. Uh, and lactulose is also fantastic for this, but also resistant starch and right. FODMAPs in general. It doesn't have to be inulin. It could be any number of FODMAPs. Right. But again, it's, it's hopefully this is going to show the slippery slope that we talk about, where again, there are so many people who combine a quote unquote low histamine diet with a low FODMAP diet. <laughs> Yeah. And they think that they have to treat the histamine and starve the SIBO at the same time. And it's like, you don't realize you're creating the perfect environment for the bacteria to grow and produce more histamine for you and for your body to not be able to cope with histamine and excrete it efficiently. And you're digging yourself a deeper hole. You don't even have a shovel at that point. You have like a backhoe and you're digging the hole deeper oh, with God. a backhoe at this point, Right. That's an image. I'm yeah. I'm seeing you with a backhoe for some reason. Just like I feel like I could figure it out. Yeah. I don't know. I grew up on a farm. I feel I'm like I'm pretty sure I could not figure it granted, out. I never I'd drove just... farm equipment. Oh man. Yeah. We'll we'll figure it out. That'll be an episode for another day, perhaps. But if I may, my sweet, I have mm-hmm. one more plug. Earlier okay. I plugged the podcast as a whole because let's face it, it's rad. The other thing I want to make mention of now in the outro is that FODMAP Freedom is still open for enrollment, but only until Thursday of this week. So if you haven't taken a look at it, you haven't considered it yet, I would love to help you in your journey. As you can see, there's a lot of bullshit out on the internet, and that's probably a big part of what's keeping you stuck up until this point. And I'm going to do my best to not only dispel that bullshit and help you see what's really going on with your body, but also give you the coaching and the feedback that you need to make progress and implement all the stuff into your life. 
So if you want to check out FODMAP Freedom, I would be delighted to help you. Go to FODMAPfreedom.com slash enroll, E-N-R-O-L-L. And I would love to help you this fall. Otherwise, if you're hearing if you're hearing this episode more than a week after it posts, then hopefully I'll see you in FODMAP Freedom in January. And you can go to that same URL and we will be enrolling again with our next group in January 2025. So thank you for entertaining my shtick. In the meantime, we will see these folks in the next episode. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Come visit us again. <laughs>